All right, folks, welcome. I am John Najarian, and uh, that other gentleman on the screen you see there is my good friend, uh, business partner, Mark Lepresti, uh, both uh, a lawyer. Uh, I don't hold that against him, though. Um, but uh, he was a, a trader on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. He started off like me. He started off as a runner on the New York. We'll get a little background from him. He'll do a better job of it than I will. Um, but so he went from a runner on the floor there to somebody who was working with Lehman Brothers, um, going to night school, getting his law degree, um, putting together a lot of big uh, hedge funds and still does operate that business. But also now uh, together, We've been doing a lot of alternative data with Battlefin, which is a company that he co-founded with Tim Harrington, and uh, also um, IDI, a, a, a private equity or a venture capital firm that many of us in the uh, uh, family office space join together and look at deals and then fund some of those deals if we like them. Um, I think many of you have heard me say one of them was with Sofia Vargara, uh, called Ebby, and it's a uh, women's intimates. <laughs> I don't know why they're not making men's intimates, Mark. Because we can't sell them, John. That's why. No. <laughs> um, but Mark, maybe if you wouldn't mind, let people know, I, because like I say, I know you have a rich history in New York. Um, and the fact that you started on the floor, we literally started almost exactly the same as runners on the trading floors, if you could give yeah. them a little background in that, and then we'll dive into alternative data. Yeah, so terrific. John, thank you so much for having me. Uh, greetings to everybody that's taken the time to tune in today and watch uh, John and I do our thing. As he points out, I am coming to you live from what is still the financial capital of the world, New York City, Lower Manhattan. I am not standing on the Brooklyn Bridge, as the background may belie. I am social distancing and staying at home as everybody should be doing. Um, as uh, John, thank you for that illustrious curriculum vitae. Most of it's true, but it's usually the good part that John gets right. Um, so as he points out, I'm 25 years on Wall Street, 20 of which uh, as a lawyer, uh, seven or so as, a, as an angel investor and a venture capitalist. Um, and we're here today to talk about uh, the alternative data industry and a company that I am uh, very proud to have co-founded with Tim Harrington, who uh, John mentioned a moment ago. And, and the company, as I think many of you probably know, um, is called Battlefin. And what Battlefin does is it aggregates unique alternative data sets from all over the world and brings them together in a central place so buyers and users of alternative data can identify data sets and use cases that help make them better and smarter investors. Yep, and it's amazing stuff, folks. Um, you may have heard several times uh, I've referenced it on CNBC. We will be launching a product with Battlefin, with, in other words, with Mark and Tim, the co-founders of Battlefin, um, cherry picking some of the best alternative data providers. They have hundreds, hundreds of alternative data providers, folks, I'll flip through a quick deck that kind of shows you guys a, a little bit about that. But when you look at who supports this, when you look at uh, Battlefin, which as Mark and Tim both say, they started uh, on the back of a, a napkin at a bar, just you know, saying, hey, what if we plugged this in and you know, decided to create something out of this? Um, it has grown from that, something on a napkin in a bar, to something that now has, I think, over 600 firms that provide, that plug in to the Battlefin Ensemble platform that lets people um, take a look, a sample, if you will, uh, of, of some of these alternative data sources. Some of them, folks, are wildly expensive. And they are because they can be, because A, it's very unique data that's market moving, B, um, some of it's very expensive to gather. I mean, uh, you know, we'll talk about it's one of the satellite companies that's basically, you know, taking satellite images and they're not just looking at cars in a Walmart parking lot anymore, folks. It's a lot more detailed than that. 
uh, but it's also way beyond just credit cards and how much did somebody buy on their Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express or whatever. It's much deeper now, especially with email receipts where people can actually, uh, you know, there's machine learning, there's artificial intelligence, there's a little human, uh, the human intelligence that's added to that to let you really know um, what somebody has bought uh, when they've charged their credit card and they've chosen to get it as an email receipt, much richer data that way than just knowing that somebody spent $1,000 at this particular retailer. You can drill down into what they bought with that email receipt and so forth. Um, and they've got, uh, get this folks, they've got uh, Jeffries who bought in with them uh, to this concept and has helped explode this business onto multiple continents now. Um, you've also got uh, um, Refinitiv mm -hmm. and BlackRock, right, Mark? Blackstone behind Black Refinitiv. Stone, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the biggest of the big folks that are paying attention to this and everybody from Stevie Cohen over at Point72, by the way, Tim Harrington, Mark's partner in the co-founding of Battlefin used to trade over there at Stevie's shop when it was SAC, I think, right, Mark? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Managing. You know, John, it's uh, it's really interesting when when people ask me what this is about, what what is this alternative data? Um, I often explain to people that just about everybody on the planet, certainly anybody that has a smart device or an iPhone, is currently participating in the alternative data industry. Yep. And people look at me and say, well, well how, you know, how is that possible? And the short version, folks, and you've heard a lot about this from the perspective of personal privacy and data protection, but everything that we do, every time we you know, order a ride share, have something delivered to our home, uh, you know, book a table on an app, uh, every time we turn our phones on, it's actually transmitting our location. Everything that we do every day, all day, forget about what we do on social media, where we're essentially asking the world to come and, and, and take our data and understand more about us. But everything consumers do every day, all day long, especially when we can't go to brick and mortar stores and are cooped up in our houses during this COVID crisis, is generating troves, tons and tons and tons of data that's being harvested by a whole bunch of very smart companies around the world that have figured out how to take this data, how to analyze it, how to capture it, and how to provide that information, those unique insights on not only on companies, because of course we're gonna talk about how John and I and others are using that alternative data to be better investors, better traders, right? And that's the ethos of Market Rebellion and what John and Pete and Dirk and Chris and the whole very talented team at that organization do every single day to make all of you better traders and better investors. We're gonna talk about that, but we're also using this data to do things like help corporations better manage their enterprise, their supply chain, human resource issues. And in a time of crisis like this, using that data to try to understand the course and the path of this horrible pandemic that we're all dealing with to help make better informed decisions as individuals, as policymakers, as investors about how this is going to impact the economy, when will it end, how do we flatten the curve and things like that. And we've been really, really proud over these past three weeks with the help of John and Cognobi Labs and other of the absolute rock star data providers that we're so pl pleased to have on the Battlefield platform to help bring this really unique information that you can't get anywhere else to help us understand how we can survive and come out the other side of this crisis as better and stronger people. And we will. Very true. Well said, Mark. Um, Thank you. So folks, let me um, flip through some slides. I'm not gonna go through them uh, quite as in depth as uh, we might sometimes, uh, but I want you to see some of the success stories that we've already had with this data, as well as um, you know the growth of this as an industry. And uh, this sector is just exploding. So with that said, 
I'm going to uh, share the screen uh, and I'm going to uh, Mark go down here and start the a little bit of this the presentation. Sure. All right, alternative data, folks. Um, there's Pete and me, and we're talking about alternative data for trading. Um, there's, uh, you know, we were lucky enough that we've had a number of these that we're able to talk about on CNBC and here with uh, our subscribers, Mark. Um, and this is just, a, you know, a little slide to give you guys an idea of the sorts of things. Mark and I are going to talk about crude oil in just a bit, but this is housing. This is um, you know, when under normal circumstances uh, with airline travel, what exactly people are doing, um, what cities are they visiting, as far as private jets and all the rest, there's so much data uh, that you can find out. Uh, I'm just giving you a quick idea, folks, of how big the industry is. Um, and again, Battlefin, Mark, how many years has Battlefin been going on with uh, the New York, uh, Singapore, uh, London, Miami events that you guys do? Well, we, we've had the events business really from the start, John, but it started out as a uh, hundred and change or so data nerds, uh, you know, huddled uh, at a hotel in Miami some six and a half years ago. Um, that events business, is, as you point out, um, has, has grown and expanded. Uh, we do, uh, as you know, uh, Miami at the end of January uh, every year. New York in June, um, we do London in October, and then either Singapore or Hong Kong, we also did it in the Valley uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, that, that business, of course, as it relates to having live conferences, um, unfortunately is, is on hold at the moment, uh, given uh, you know, the, the, the social distancing and, and all of the stuff we're trying to do to slow the spread of this horrible uh, pandemic. But uh, what we did, and I, I attribute the success of this or the anticipated success of this to Tim and Dustin and the, and the tech and the visual team, we've actually taken our Battlefield Discovery Day conferences and turned them virtual. So uh, coming up in April, I believe, 15th and 16th, and if I'm wrong, uh, go to our website, www.battlefin.com. You can learn about all of our events and you can register for what we believe will be a very unique experience where we are trying to replicate as best we can the experience of being with uh, us and the entire alternative data community uh, for two days. We're gonna be hosting uh, virtual uh, uh, panels and uh, speaking events, as well as one-on-one -on -one meetings. As you may remember, John, last year in June, you were with us at the Plaza Hotel, uh, where we were also proud uh, that, that uh, two days uh, to announce the investment that we received from, from Refinitiv that you mentioned uh, earlier, who we're very, very proud to have as a partner in Battlefin. Um, but we had actually oh, somewhere over about 3,000 one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings that we were able to facilitate between data buyers and sellers in that uh, brief two-day period. So we're going to be doing almost all of it, including, if I have my way, a digital virtual cocktail party at the end. Um, uh, but we're going to be taking it all online and then coming back to you again as soon as it's safe, folks. We're going to be bringing the live events back. Um, certainly no uh, later, I hope, than, than London in October and, and sooner if we can. Um, but yeah, we are very proud to have created what, what we believe is one of the most compelling. There are others. There are other data events in the business as the business continues to grow. But you know, we, we think ours, ours are the best. At that event we did at the Plaza last year, we had over 1,100 people uh, present with us. It was fantastic, folks, as was the London event. And uh, those one-on-ones, the reason that that's important, folks, for those of you who are investors, and that's not a put-down saying you're an investor or even a, a at-home DIY trader, um, those one-on-ones allow these uh, big data buyers to sit down with a data provider and try to figure out how they might be able to plug into that data and use it. And yeah. like I say, a lot of these are quite expensive. Some of them run north of $40,000 a month. So again, I'm not subscribing to those, but luckily through Mark and through Battlefin, I'm able to use some of that data, model it, and then figure out which ones of these uh, you know, 600 plus companies, we can actually uh, create some uh, alternative data for the market rebellion crowd. So yeah. with that said, uh, last year it was over a billion dollar industry. 
this was estimated because this slide is from December. Um, and then this year, it's supposed to be up, you know, to about one and three quarter billion dollar business. Um, top no, we're, not, we're not seeing your slides. Oh, you're not? No. I'm sure the audience would much rather see my face, but I, I think if we're going to reference the slides. <laughs> huh. Okay, let me see here. Uh... Well, folks, while, while John's doing that, um, you know, what we've tried to do since alternative data has traditionally been something, there we go, something okay. that has been used exclusively, almost exclusively, by the very large asset managers and hedge funds, some of them that you see here on that slide, that can afford to actually buy these very high-end subscriptions to these data sets. Battlefin and Market Rebellion have been working together to create a product that I know some of the Market Rebellion audience has heard us talk about this either in Las Vegas at the fantastic event that John and Pete did last October, which I was very proud to uh, be a featured speaker at, uh, but also in other things that we've done on Market Rebellion. We're working to bring this alternative data to the individual trader. And one of the things that's uh, part of the challenge with that is that alternative data very uh, traditionally is not readily consumable. People often talk about it as a fire hose. In fact, there's a, a feed, a very expensive feed you can buy from Twitter that's actually called the fire hose uh, that some of our sentiment providers uh, subscribe to. And we get some really fantastic insights out of that. But what we've been trying to do, and John's gonna show you some examples, is take this really unique stuff that the pros use to make real money in these, even in these markets and bring it to the individual investor. So John, maybe that's a, a good segue to some of the slides that, that you're, you're, you're gonna uh, tee up right now. All right. Um, do you see that MIT slide, Mark? Did that flip? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So MIT, um, their scientists have already said that alternative data beats analysts almost 60% of the time, folks. And this is by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, the reason that so many of these uh, uh, hedge funds subscribe is that there are 600 different firms, there's actually more than that now, uh, that are out there providing data uh, that, you know, the, the great thing about the Battlefin events, it's not a, a sales pitch, but the great thing about those events, folks, is that you can see many of those 600 plus firms in one place. Yeah. So you can pick and choose which ones really would fit your particular style if you're a hedge fund. And that's why uh, the, the room is filled with all of the, you know, it's a combination of people with pocket protectors and uh, folks <laughs> wearing $7,000 suits like Mark, uh, because they're there because those hedge funds are trading this data and using it to manage billions of dollars. So Orbital Insight, something we'll show you in just a bit, that's one of those companies that as the name sort of implies, these guys are looking at satellite images and determining uh, things like, okay, how, how damaged was the Saudi facility when those uh, uh, drone attacks occurred uh, a little over a year ago? Exactly how fast could they get back up? Um, when did they begin drawing down on their supplies that were above ground that people could see and they could tell by the shadows and so forth, you know, as the uh, uh, supplies being drawn down, all that kind of cool stuff. Okay, this is what a lot of that data falls into these categories. Email receipts, it's about 7%. Web traffic, which is virtually every thing that you might imagine on the web. Web data scraping, which is different. Um, credit card and debit card information, and then other. Um, when you're looking at this, and the reason we have our heat seeker jet there is that you've got so many of these different data sets about what is going on with companies, um, which ones, you know, everything from job listings, store locations, you know, pricing of products, competing products, all that kind of stuff. Um, this one was interesting because again, last year, just after the June event, Bloomberg, who had reporters at the uh, Battlefin event, yeah. a couple of which that I had met there and I'd known from television, said that, hey, hedge funds are tracking private jets to look for deals. 
because if all of a sudden you see, you know, Buffett's private jet somewhere with another private jet, you might figure that there's a deal that could be being struck based on that. There are people who will subscribe to that. Um, here was one of the alternative data times I got to mention it on CNBC um, with uh, Battlefin data. And we were saying, hey, this is where the alpha is now. This company, M Science, that again, my dog Dexter, um, M Science has put in, um, has a big investment slug from uh, Jeffries. And they've grown from just a couple folks to, I think, Mark, if I'm not mistaken, 140 people, data scientists, salespeople, and so forth at M Science. Yeah. And they gave us great insight, folks, into transaction data, weather data, web data, and clickstream data as far as how was Lowe's going to do into earnings. And based on all of those inputs, they told us that this looks like an outperformer. Lowe's jumped 11% after that information. Um, and this was provided days ahead of the actual earnings report. So not, you know, snap of your fingers time critical, but gave everybody from the hedge funds to the people that followed Battlefin the, the, the time to get into those trades. Yeah. Um, here's another it, time. Go ahead, Mark. No, it's, it's really about, um, and that, that's a great slide to pause on, um, it, folks, it's really about understanding what's going on when we're talking about it in the context of investing and trading, right? Um, it's, a, it's about understanding what's really going on with these listed companies, with these issuers, especially the big consumer names, the tech companies, what's really going on with their financials. What are they not saying in their quarterly filings? What information are the folks running those companies themselves looking at to try to understand what and predict what their earnings are going to be and represent the financial condition of the company? This is the new inside information, but legal inside information. Let me make that very clear. Hedge funds and other smart investors are more interested in understanding what these data streams are telling them about real-time consumer activity, buying, selling, subscribing, unsubscribing. We're gonna talk about Netflix in a minute. We're very proud uh, of the trades that John's gonna talk about that we did in Q4 of last year around Netflix earnings, which were absolutely heart-stopping. Uh, but it's, it's really about understanding how to use this information. And folks, as I say a lot of times during these events, it's information that we are all helping to create every day. So why not take advantage of it to be better investors? It's about harnessing that information to anticipate how these companies are going to perform. John, why don't you take us into some of the Netflix stuff I think is coming up next. All right. So here you go. Um, just as Mark said, folks, where that arrow is pointing to, um, that's showing us that uh, they had actually a flat quarter. Notice the, you know, the left side of that Netflix graph is showing a very steady progression to the upside. All of a sudden, they flattened out, um, and that was international. That's supposed to be where the growth is in Netflix. So because they flattened out, um, we wanted to basically make sure that we got into a short position with puts and so forth, and Netflix tanked after that. In fact, fell over $125 over, a, I think, a 10-day period yeah. after that information came out in July. So this is, of course, after their earnings report, where they basically admitted to, um, hey, yeah, in, international was uh, not exactly where we thought it would be. Then you've got something like Grubhub here. So Grubhub, um, they have a lot of competition, of course, um, because you guys know Seamless, depending what city you're in. You know DoorDash, Postmates, Uber uh, Eats, all of those are competitors to Grubhub. So if all of a sudden we see web traffic through similar web, I believe the people that provided this index, yeah. if they're showing us that, uh, that people are not downloading this app as much, not accessing the app as much. In other words, every time you and I open that app, folks, whether it's Uber, whether it's Grubhub, 
whether it's Postmates, doesn't matter. Somebody is tracking that. And if, if we're opening them less frequently, that's something that could be a negative projection for earnings. And it certainly was correct in the case of this one. Here was a daily average uh, users and so forth. And it really highlighted that um, DoorDash, Seamless, Postmates, Uber Eats were all crushing Grubhub during this particular time frame. And what happened? Well, we also noticed unusual put activity. The stock was almost $60 in, uh, uh, as you can see on the far left side of that screen, it says the date, 10-28-2019. So in other words, October 28th in Grubhub, folks were getting very, uh, 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 at least interested in the downside, if not outright just bearish, and they were buying puts. This represents 200,000 share equivalent, just this one trade at the 55 put strike in Grubhub. And there it is dropping from 60 bucks a share down to 35. So the puts, these 55 puts went from basically that price, $2, let's call it, to $15. So you made better than 700% on your money on that trade if you followed that smart money. And we had it both with unusual option activity as well as that alternative data. Now, and John, let me, if I could stop you for one second, sure. I just want to jump in and, and point out, folks, that's a great example, by the way. You know, this, this is not snake oil. There's nothing, you know, magic about this. You still have to be diligent. You still have to do your homework. You still have to be smart, cautious, careful investors, especially in the choppy waters that we're in right now. But the slide that John showed you a moment ago is a great example of how alternative data can be used not only for idea generation, but to confirm. So John and his team, of course, as I know most of the audience knows, have this unbelievable signal, this unusual options activity report, um, which is a combination of software and the really brilliant minds at Mark Rebellion that look at unique options activity to give an indication of, is a particular stock gonna go up or down? And when you combine that with the kind of unique information and insights we're getting with this alternative data, it starts to become really, really powerful stuff. And, and by the way, and I'll just tease this out a tiny bit, one of the things that's so powerful about the alternative data platform at Ensemble, that, which is what our uh, platform at Battlefin is called, is that you can combine and mix and match different data sets to get even more unique and even informed insights that are specific to what you're trying to figure out. John, get, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, this is another one of those data providers, folks, Cognovi Labs. Yeah. And Benny and his team over at Cognovi have been putting together great stuff for us with alternative data and event impact. So for instance, um, Tuesday of this week, they were talking about um, the ticker symbol KMB and they were saying impact high. Uh, and any, any headlines that come out, any, uh, for instance, uh, uh, market sentiment, even uh, sentiment that, that you don't know that you're uh, putting out, folks. In other words, if I say something bad on Twitter, somebody could determine that, yeah, that's a negative sentiment about that particular company. But there are other ways that people uh, provide that without saying it out loud. Uh, and much of that falls into the category that Cognovi tracks and, you know, you look at the second one Wednesday this week when they're talking about Lulu, um, you know, when they're saying, hey, you know, this one particular senator sold a lot of Lulu stock, um, be per perhaps because she was informed as to why, um, you know, the, the coronavirus was accelerating at the pace that it was and where it might be going to next. So... The reason we have Cognovi up here also, folks, is that Cognovi um, has been creating a panic map for us. And that panic map, um, Mark has had conversations, I can't say whom with, but it's a network that we all know. Um, and 
that uh, panic index, it's great that we have John Hopkins with their fabulous map of the United States and the world. And you can see by uh, um, the size of the dot on the map, how large the outbreak is and so forth of uh, coronavirus and how many hospital beds or how many people have recovered, you know, all that kind of data. That's great. But the stuff that Cognovi has drills down into the cities and can tell you in the city what's going on, how many um, cases in that city and what's the impact to uh, economies in that city. It's just amazing stuff. Yeah, and let's, and let's talk about that for a minute, John. Um, can you hear me, by the way? Laura's telling me I'm having some tech issues. I'm hearing you fine. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, what uh, John's talking about is what we've been developing with our friends at Cognovi Labs, uh, which is it's an absolutely uh, fantastic data provider that we're very happy to have on the platform, uh, that we have been specifically tracking and using alternative data, as I was saying before, to understand the path of this virus and how it's impacting not only individual names uh, and equities, but, but the economy generally. And, and what's really interesting is Cognovi first started seeing indications of uh, this uh, crisis, the pandemic starting to reach the United States in, in uh, call it late January, around the 25th or the 26th, where there was a lot of chatter on Constellation brands, believe it or not, around uh, negative sentiment around Corona beer. Um, and and Cognobi's system picked this up and started to start to look at this and say, hey, this, there's something going on here. And actually they were able as a result of watching these alternative data sources that they track to start to anticipate before I think a lot of others, unfortunately, including in our government did, uh, that, that this thing was coming and, and it was gonna be, uh, it was gonna be really, really bad. Um, this this Cognovi Labs uh, panic index around uh, COVID-19 is actually available uh, available through Battlefield, also through Cognovi's website, and I'd really uh, encourage folks to, to go and check it out. Um, it gives an entirely different layer than what the, uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, uh, map, which I don't know about you, John, all that map does is scare the hell out of me. It's not much information I can use. <laughs> yeah, um, and the key words, folks, that come up. I mean, he, they are sorting through hundreds and thousands of key words that pop up. And when one of them pops up, uh, chances are it's something that's going to move markets. That's right. Uh, and it's, uh, I love that bug or that panic index. It's just fantastic. Mark, this was a slide that you sent me from the, yeah. order, uh, no, from Clipper data, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. This is from Clipper. So, Folks, you know that uh, MBS, which is Mohammed bin Salman, and by the way, Mark, Mark is a futures trader as well, folks. Um, MBS over in Saudi got into that big fight with Putin and they both just started producing like crazy. And uh, the question is at what point do they run out of storage for yeah. crude oil? Because you know they, uh, they've been producing at a clip with airlines shutting down or at least dramatically cutting back on their service. And ships and airlines are the biggest consumers of crude oil followed yeah. by the US consumer folks. So when you put all that together and you say US consumers aren't traveling much at all, you know, hardly at all, um, ships, only a minimum amount of ships are out there and obviously no cruise lines really anymore. Right. And airlines have cut way back Mark, tell them what Clipper data did with this uh, plot they're looking at on the screen. But, you know, th this is a great example, John, because um, this is stuff that just happened in the past couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would send my, my morning, uh, you know, pre-dawn text to John knowing that he's doing his workout videos at five o'clock in the morning back in Chicago and say, you know, John, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, the XLE puts, I, I, I want to. I, th I think oil is looking like it's going to be 20 bucks, you know, in the next three or four days. And I want to trade the oil futures. I want to trade the XLEs. You know, what do you think? There's absolutely no way that with the cruise ships in dock, everybody's car is sitting in the driveway. And as John points out, OPEC and Pu uh, Putin uh, having a, you know, a, a you know what a contest and letting oil flow like crazy. 
a uh, lot of opportunity, a lot of uh, uh, potential for folks to, to make a lot of money. And, 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 we, and we did, uh, we did uh, actually trade quite a bit of oil futures uh, that week um, and did pretty well. But we tried to decide, I personally was saying, John, where do we think this thing's going? Because they cannot just let the taps flow and let oil continue to flow without any indication of where this is going to stop. And we said, you know what? We know what we've got firms on Battlefin like Clipper Data, like Orbital Insights that use really, really unique and large uh, part um, satellite imagery and, and drone data to understand what the storage capacity of the oil industry was. You've seen, I'm sure, folks, these huge oil storage tanks as you drive down the highway or pictures of them in different parts of the world. If we had an indication of what the reality is in terms of storage, because you had a lot of oil industry so-called experts on CNBC and other uh, news channels saying, look, folks, this is going to go even lower. We, we have not, you know, we're testing the bottom, but 19 is not the floor because there's no place to put more of this oil. You've got tankers that are floating around full of oil that they're using as proxies for storage. And we looked at the alternative data and the alternative data showed us, no. That's not the case. And just as recently as the past two days, and this is public, you can actually go to, uh, I believe, to Orbital Insights websites. I know the, the CEO of Orbital Insight actually shared this uh, late yesterday on, on LinkedIn. Um, we are sharing this information, folks, um, and, and, and trying to help make everybody better investors um, and let everybody know, hey, wait a second here. There is not this uh, storage problem that everybody perceives there to be. And then John, you, you can talk about, you know, what happened in oil, you know, from a, from a 19 and change to a, to a 28 in a, in what, a, a, a 24 hour or less period in the past two days. Yeah. Yeah. That was an incredible pop Mark. Uh, but it gave us a great opportunity. We thought to um, put on some puts and I did. Yeah. Um, I know Mark had already been in uh, some positions and cashed out uh, and then when all of a sudden you get a move, folks, from 29 or from 19 to 28, almost 29, that created, uh, you know, certainly made a lot of those put spreads look pretty interesting because how much of that would we retrace and how quickly would we retrace that? Um, that's why, Mark, uh, when we saw unusual put activity just yesterday, I think some of that might be based on exactly what your uh, graphs and what the people at Clipper Data and Orbital Insights were telling you. And that right. is that there might be another, what, billion barrels of storage that are unused right now? Yeah, we're not, we're not running out of it is the, is the short version. And particularly if there's any hope uh, towards some of the conversations that are happening right now between Washington and the relevant parts of the world, uh, you know, we could, we could see a, a, a continued recovery in, in oil uh, but but I, I am, you know, people were asking me last week, you know, do I think 20? Do I think 19? How long do I think 20 or 19? I, I think we're away from those levels and assuming, you know, that things continue. We're probably not heading in that same direction at, at those lows, you know, in the, in the near future. Yeah, here's another slide of that, folks. And um, Mark, is this basically just showing us storage um, and and. Uh, is the, the line on the screen more or less just showing us the, the, the direction of the dots? Yeah, I, I, I believe that's true, yes, John. So, I mean, like I say, folks, alternative data, you know, a, a lot of us, when we look at a place like China, we're trying to figure out, okay, most of us, you know, 99% of the world, probably 100% of the world outside of China knows that China's lying about any stat they give us. You know, what? whether it's- Are you, uh, how, are you how sure, John? <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> whether it's how many cases during this pandemic, whether it's how many deaths, whether it's their GDP, whether it's factory utilization, um, what, what the banks are actually uh, doing, how much cash they actually have. The rest of the world is very doubtful, uh, but uh, alternative data sources can even get through big uh, totalitarian regimes like that 
to find out what's really going on. I mean, when you're looking at, you know, loadings of jets and uh, ships that are coming into or out of a port, um, how deep is that ship in the water and all this kind of stuff, folks. Yeah. You know, there are things that um, certainly give you a nice tip off. And again, that's why, uh, you know, the likes of Citadel, who you saw on an earlier slide, or Stevie Cohen's point seventy two. I would posit, Mark, that there are probably any any hedge fund that has more than fifty million in it right now probably has somebody. If they're not already trading on alternative data, they've got somebody exploring it and trying to start exploiting that alternative data. Well, we, you know, we've certainly seen, John, as, as the markets developed over the past couple of years, the use of alternative data expand from just the biggest of the big boys who could afford to have, you know, a fully staffed data teams with PhDs, data science PhDs. You remember me saying earlier that one of the big challenges with alternative data is that a lot of it is raw, uh, a lot of it is, is not readily consumable. Right. So you need data scientists, you need a lot of computing power, you need a lot of staff to try to figure this stuff out and to make it usable. That is, in fact, one of the main things that Tim and I uh, set out to do, uh, which was to start the democratization of the use of this data by creating things like uh, Battlefield Ensemble that makes this stuff a lot more easy to find, to, to test, to set, uh, to, to uh, source. And, and to use. And of course, you know, as we keep teasing out, ultimate iteration of that, we hope and we expect will be a product that we're gonna be delivering to you, to the Market Rebellion audience and subscribers. That's right, folks. And um, if you wanna see more about um, what Mark has been putting together with Battlefin, everything from those online conferences that he spoke about to, uh, um, the uh, ensemble platform that allows you to see, you know, what's going on in the markets um, and, uh, you know, to get a password and to be able to go on to ensemble and take a look at many of these sorts of things that we're talking about, it will blow you away. Um, but it's, it's almost like that uh, fire hose again that Mark spoke of. There is so much data that is coming at you that even if you can afford it, you need these data scientists to basically assemble it into something that's readable instead of just zeros and ones and trying to figure out what's going on. Because some of these types of data folks are coming at you in the billions of bits of information per day. Yeah. Um, because, you know, credit cards, I forget what it is, Mark, uh, just credit card data is 20 some odd thousand per second, is it, globally? Some crazy number like that? Yeah, John, I, I thought you promised that there would be no math quiz on this particular <laughs> live stream. So, so I, I'm, I'm entirely on, yeah, yes, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a lot, uh, it's a lot. So we will be, um, as we get this, uh, this panic bug, folks, um, this map where you can drill down into it and see it by city within the United States, We'll get that out to you guys um, through one of these webinars so you can actually see it. But you can go to the Battlefin site, you can go to Cognovi, but we really think that this is pretty important for the country as well to know exactly uh, when we are seeing that peak, Mark, when we are seeing things starting to roll over and so forth. And I think that's gonna be just hugely important for you know the, all of us to feel a little more comfortable about um, getting involved in a bigger way in stocks. Yeah, well, I, I, we're working right now with the with Benny and his team at Cognovi, and and I hope actually to be able to uh, have a link to that map and that panic index that we'll be able to provide on the Market Rebellion website, and that, and that might be available uh, as early as Monday. So so stay tuned for that. Uh, but John, since I think we're, we're about to wrap, I wanted to just thank you and the Market Rebellion team for allowing me the opportunity to participate in this dialogue. Uh, as you know, 
Uh, we at Battlefin are huge fans of everything that you guys do at Mark the Rebellion. We're so pleased to have you and, and Pete and, and the whole team uh, as part of the Battlefin family. Um, and to the Mark Rebellion audience and to all of you that took the time in the middle of this madness to join us and to listen to what John and I had to say, I want to thank you for your time. I want to wish you the absolute best of luck as you try to navigate these markets. And as I've said at the end of all of these webinars and live streams I've done, since this panic began, and I'm going to continue to say this until it's over, folks, entrepreneurs, small business investors, people like you are going to lead this recovery, and we're going to be part of it and be there along with you. So thank you very much, John, Pete, Laura, Dirk, the whole Mark Rebellion team. I hope to see you guys again real soon. And John, I miss you. I miss having I miss dinner you, once man. a week. Like something's missing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I miss the steaks. <laughs> I, 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 miss, I miss the drinks. I just missed no drinks. I, I, don't, I don't drink. I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I don't know what. Uh, well, <laughs> we're about to start one of those in about five minutes with our with our Market Rebellion subscribers, Mark, a little virtual cocktail party. So Mark Very Lepresti, nice. Battlefin folks, check it out. And he's also with the Lepresti Law Group in New York City, um, a firm that he founded. So if you're somebody who's putting together a hedge fund and you need somebody, he's your guy. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, John. See you soon. See you soon, sir. Thank you, Laura.